Pretty much across the board, in all three different modes, Black Ops 3 had some very well-documented issues at launch. Call of Duty campaigns were usually fun, low-investment, popcorn action movies, but this time, it was a cerebral sci-fi thriller told in the most experimental way the series has ever gotten. On the multiplayer side, this was right in the middle of the controversial dip into advanced movement with the emphasis on verticality and wall running, which a lot of fans felt was directly opposed to the core ideals of the series. It was during this game's life cycle that the Infinite Warfare trailer came out and became one of the top 5 most disliked YouTube videos of all time just because it showed that there would be jetpacks again. That gives you a pretty good sense of how the community felt about the game that they were currently playing. And then, of course, most relevant to this series was the zombies situation. The Giant was locked behind the season pass, and even if you had it, it was seen more as the remake that it was than a truly new experience. The only actual launch map was Shadows of Evil, and even players who praise it as a masterpiece today will usually admit that they were pretty put off by it at the time. Every single thing on the map was complex and hard to pick up without using external guides, even down to the basics like Pack-a-Punch. So, a lot of players tried the only thing that was available to them on launch day, and bashed their head against a wall a couple of times without making any progress, and then just wrote off the mode entirely. And, even worse for a lot of people, the setting and atmosphere had shifted dramatically away from its trademark, grounded, post-World War II alt-history. Shadows of Evil dropped any hint of those Doris roots and went all in on being a story about Lovecraftian old gods and aliens from other dimensions. The fact that there was even a new cast of characters there reminded players of the launch of Black Ops 2. Transit and Die Rise also dropped the fan-favorite Ultimus crew right after they'd had a very successful map in the previous game, and we've already talked about how poorly that change was received the first time. All this is just to say, fans were worried. In almost every way, it felt like the mode was straying away from what made people fall in love with it in the first place. The developers obviously saw this, and they needed to find a way to start rebuilding that trust with the fanbase to make sure that people didn't give up on Black Ops 3 before it had even gotten started. So, the first DLC map was Der Eisenrache, a map that was almost reverential in how many references it had to the history of the mode. It was kind of the prototype for Revelations, with it being a highlight reel of elements from a bunch of different fan-favorite maps. In that map, it was meant to be more of a celebration of the history of zombies, but here, it was more specifically intended to remind fans that this was still the same mode they fell in love with. That if they would just stick around and trust the developers, they would respect that foundation that got us here while still building on top of it and giving us something new. I should never have trusted you, Richtofen. Never. The appeal to nostalgia started with the aesthetics. Like in Shadows, the setting was a cross between two elements that were so different that when they were put together, they felt very new. Unlike Shadows, this time they pulled those elements from things that had already worked in past maps so that they didn't feel so jarring. The base layer was medieval fantasy, which had already been tried and tested a bit in Origins. They really pushed the envelope here, though, with the whole map taking place in a reconstruction of a real-life 11th century castle that was decorated with stone statues of knights with swords and shields and stained glass windows with mythical beasts on them. The Wonder Weapon was a time-period-appropriate bow and arrow, and you got it by interacting with fire-breathing dragon heads. Then, grafted on top of that, was something even more nostalgic. In the lore, Group 935 took over this castle as a research base, so we got the return of that classic De Ries style science fiction. There were bodies of World War II era German soldiers, and those retro-futuristic pieces of technology like the phosphorescent screens in the control room. The teleporter that was in the lab was a one-to-one -one replica of the one from De Ries. And there were also the more grounded, human touches that reminded players of characters from that era too, like the living spaces for Dr. Maxis and Sam. Even the name was a bit of a throwback, with it being the first map with a name in a different language since all the way back on Kino Toten. 
Originally, the trend with the names was to make them translations based on where the map took place, but as they moved away from the World War II setting, they dropped that around the same time. So, bringing that back here, at the same time that they went back to that old setting, was an almost subconscious way to further reinforce that idea that they were hearkening back to those old days. That back-to-basics approach was, in a more limited way, brought to the gameplay too. For one, there was no gimmick to turning on power. It was just a single binary switch that turned everything on at the same time, just like it was all the way back in Verrucht. Pack-a-punching was just a matter of interacting with three different pads, and at each one there was a diagram showing you where to find the next one, so it was a lot like Doris or Ascension. Enemy-wise, the Hellhounds were back for that classic max ammo round we hadn't seen on a mainline map since all the way back at the start of Black Ops 1. Something that isn't as obvious just from the aesthetics, but completely defines it for anyone who's ever made any attempt at the easter egg, is how much the story for the map pulls from that early era as well. It's a direct sequel slash inverted reimagining of Moon, the finale of Black Ops 1. It takes place in the 40s when Griffin Station was still active and Dr. Groff was still running that moon base, so we got to play through conversations we'd only ever heard on radios before. As you go through the easter egg, you'll play a memory game that isn't the same thing as Samantha says for Moon, but pressing the four screens in sequence is really evocative of it. The Vril device that you had to charge up makes another appearance here, and so does the Moon Pyramid itself, complete with having to plug in one of its glowing soul canisters. The Undercroft has local low gravity, letting you play around with that verticality and the changes to the pace of training that it brings one more time. The very end of the easter egg is a direct inversion of that moment from Black Ops, where this time you're launching rockets from the Earth to destroy the Moon. But, the developers didn't want Der Eisendrache to be purely just a throwback map. It was meant to be more of an assertion that they could synergize the old and the new, and that there was value in all of the eras. So, for example, they also pulled from Mob of the Dead even more explicitly than Shadows of Evil did. There were three dragon heads around the map that you fed by killing zombies near them, and they had the same fiery effect and almost the exact same animations as the Cerberus heads. Like the Hell's Retriever, feeding all three was how you unlocked the wonder weapon for the map, in this case the Wrath of the Ancients bow. So the shape of the map and the pack-a-punch method were definitely very different, but they were still reminding players of that fan-favorite Black Ops 2 map. Then, of course, looming over all of Black Ops 3 is the Origins influence, and here it's both with those implicit changes to map design and more explicit actual references. There was the robot in the intro that ended up just outside the map, or the Pack-a-Punch machine not using the classic design but the Dimension 63 model. Or there was the return of the Der Wunderfizz machine, which had been missing from Shadows of Evil. The most blatant reference of all was the return of the Panzer Soldat, just wholesale reusing an iconic boss from a different map. The only real difference was that instead of its grapple hook, its ranged attack was now a projectile electric bomb. Or, taking inspiration from the staffs on Origins, instead of having one or two wonder weapons that players had to fight over, there were instead four elemental bows that all had their own individual upgrade quests, so everyone could be doing something fun. The one thing that set them apart from the staffs was that there was only a single base version that upgraded outwards from there, so everyone could work together on that initial construction quest. That basic bow that you do get for just filling up the dragon heads was a pretty viable wonder weapon on its own. It fired explosive arrows that did zero damage to the player, hearkening back to those days of Mustang and Sally with PhD Flopper. So, that base version existed that was there for everyone. But then, if you did want to put a bit of work in, you could get some things that almost went beyond being overpowered and made it actively difficult to die unless you were actually trying. The Storm Bow was the easiest to both get and to use, so most players tended to default towards that one. A lot like the Lightning Staff, it left an electrical orb down at the site of the initial explosion that stuck around to chain shock enemies with a Wunderwaffe-like effect. If you charge up your shot, you create a full lightning storm instead that covers a pretty wide radius, letting you effectively create a temporary safe area to buy a perk or revive a teammate. 
The wolf bow was really fun specifically to build with how it told the backstory of the castle the map was set in. The paintings walk you through how this wolf king rode off into battle against the Apothecons from Shadows of Evil, and then his castle came under siege, and he was eventually killed. If you look closely, you can even see that one of his subjects was inexplicably Arthur from Buried. As a weapon, it applied a super slow effect to some of the zombies that it didn't kill, and a charge shot would send out pouncing wolves to instantly clear a path in front of you. The most unique one was probably the demon bow that summoned sentient skulls from another dimension to pin zombies into place and slowly eat away at them. And the most notable thing about the fire bow was that it was by far the most technically difficult to get, with you having to hit small targets while flying at high speeds through the air. To make up for it, it was also one of the best to use, leaving lava on the ground to damage enemies over time, and fully charged arrows would trap zombies in volcanoes that eventually erupted and killed them instantly. And while we're talking about weapons, the specialist for the map was the Ragnarok DG4. The name was another callback to the World at War days, with it being the next in the line of Group 935 Wonder Weapons after the Wunderwaffe DG2 and 3 from Shinonuma and Doris. In gameplay, it was a set of gravity spikes that let you jump up and then come back down with an area of effect slam, almost the exact same as the secondary attack of the Apothecan Sword. Or you could also place it down as a trap that would pick up and stun any zombies or panzers that got close. I think the most impressive thing Dead Eisendrache does is solve the problem I mentioned in the Origins video that applies to most of these more complex maps. The issue of it being so hard to find that perfect balance where the rewards for doing side easter eggs are good enough to make them worth it without balancing the game around them and ending up punishing people who don't do what was supposed to be side content. On this map, you can learn everything you need to know to have a baseline level of success within your first game without needing to watch any YouTube videos or have someone guide you through it. You could get Pack-a-Punch open and get a very usable wonder weapon, and there were a bunch of different spots to both train and camp, so you could always find something that worked for you. But that depth was still there for players who wanted to engage with it. Despite how it looked visually, it wasn't actually going back to the more primitive days. The developers found this great balance where the casual and hardcore experiences both felt like they were intended to be viable. Take something like the Panzer Soldat, which was one of the main things that made Origins feel so unapproachable for someone who didn't know at least how to build a staff. On a pure numbers level, it's probably even more dangerous here, with its improved AI and more health. But this time, the map gave players a lot more tools to deal with them, and most importantly, those tools were spread across all levels of complexity. The Death Ray is an environmental electric trap, basically as simple as you can get, just a single button press away. When Panzers walk into it, it picks them up and stuns them, letting you get a ton of damage in on their weak points while giving you an island of complete safety to do it from. So, even an entry-level player had something that was very accessible to them that they could use to even the scales. Then all the bows were really effective against them too, and they had the added benefit of being portable, so you didn't need to cart the panzer up to the battlements to use the death ray anymore. That way, players who took that next step to maybe watch a YouTube guide and figure out how to build a bow got rewarded with a bit more convenience and freedom, but it didn't take away from the effectiveness of the original solution. And there was still one more level to go up, where you could dig into the really obscure features of the map. There was an easter egg to get the plunger as a melee weapon, where every time you killed a panzer, you'd have insta-kill on every enemy for the next minute, including other panzers. That was perfect for the boss fight, where you have entire waves of them spawning in, and even ammo for your bows can get pretty limited. Or, continuing a tradition that a lot of players didn't even know had started to happen, there was a new hat that characters could earn. The first one was the Golden Helmet, and then the Shadows of Evil Margwa Head, and now we had the Panzer Claw Helmet. After killing three panzers with rocket arms hidden around the map, every player would automatically earn it and then take massively reduced damage from every panzer attack. 
Again, these were the kind of things that if you didn't get them, or you didn't even know they existed, you wouldn't feel like you were missing out on anything. The Panzer was tough, but it was fair given the tools that anyone had access to. It was more that if you did dig into the map and exploit all the secrets, you would get to feel overpowered. There were obviously non-Panzer related easter eggs too, with varying amounts of impact on gameplay. There was a way to turn one of the rooms into a disco with music and a light show. You could visually reskin all the zombies to look like skeletons. On top of the teddy bear song, there was a way to get all the gramophones to play Dies Irae, which really helped with the medieval vibe. Like on Shadows, there was a way to get a free Mega Gobblegum. This time you were playing around with time travel to let a plant grow in the past. Or, by playing around with the wall running and low gravity, you could unlock a hidden wall buy for the BRM, a little reminiscent of the LSAT from Buried. And the main easter egg is definitely worth mentioning too. All the intermediary steps are really memorable, like overloading the teleporter to travel back in time, and the steps with the moon references I already mentioned. It was also the best example of them, again, taking things from past maps, but not just blindly copying. They actually showed how they learned from those experiences by improving on some of those elements. With Origins, the staffs don't play almost any role in the easter egg as actual weapons. Once you get them upgraded, their only real purpose is to be carted around between the site and the robots and the crazy place. You never actually need to fire the upgraded versions a single time. By comparison, on Der Reisendrache, the bows feel absolutely integral. You use them to trigger the time travel and track down the wisps, and my favorite step, gathering the souls for the keeper, has you using them to keep yourself alive in some very dangerous areas. The other big improvement was that instead of always needing to upgrade every single staff, the only requirement here was that there be one bow per player, so the process scaled a lot better for smaller lobbies and solo easter egg attempts. All of that led into the big three-part finale. First, there was the multi-phase boss fight against the giant Corrupted Keeper, which a lot of people call the first boss fight in Zombies. Personally, I definitely count the Shadow Man fight in this category too, but either way, these first couple Black Ops 3 maps were really where easter eggs reached their final evolution. Their beginnings were just as collections of pretty disconnected, random steps, but now they had evolved into a more traditional raid structure with a crescendo into a big, final encounter. Then there was that in-game cinematic moment of the rockets destroying the moon. And finally, because we were now firmly in the story-focused era, it was followed up by the first of the really touching cutscenes in Black Ops 3 that started to humanize these characters who had started off as just jokes. In it, Richtofen revealed that Tank needed to kill an alternate dimension version of himself to save the universe, which was a really somber note to end off on after the multiple big exciting moments that came right before. The last thing that I think is worth mentioning about Der Eisendrache is the physical layout. Shadows of Evil used a design philosophy we'd definitely seen before, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but by comparison, this one felt really fresh, which is great to see in its own way. The closest comparison would probably be Kino der Toten. You start with having two paths from spawn that loop around the very outer edges of the map, they meet back up on the other side and then come back down the middle with power opening up that last door back to the beginning, and Juggernog is right beside that door. But here, those big map-spanning loops were interconnected by a bunch of smaller shortcuts, which in my opinion are the trademarks of the very best and most unique Zombies maps. There were doors that opened once power was on, simple buyable alternate routes, and also the Wunderspheres that fling you across to the entire opposite side of the map. Before they could be used, you needed to activate the destination pad, which was a really efficient way to preserve the setup process. You couldn't sequence break the progression and fling somewhere that you hadn't been yet, because you had to get there the traditional way to activate the pad for the first time. Then, continuing in the Kino comparison, there was one more completely disconnected area outside of the main layout that you could only reach initially with the teleporter. The only thing making the rocket test site a mandatory visit was that there was a pack-a-punch piece there. After you get that, you could just completely ignore it. 
But even though it is outside that main flow, it earns its place by having some really fun dynamic systems going on. It's a pretty solid training area, so in a full lobby when the courtyard and the death ray bastion are taken, it's tempting to have someone go down there too. But every once in a while, the rocket will activate and force anyone down there into a bunker with no way to escape because the teleporter also gets locked off. So, every couple minutes you're going back and forth between low stakes, pretty wide open training, and desperate close quarter survival, which really helps to keep the game feel engaging, way more than it would be if you were permanently in either mode. Where Shadows of Evil quietly took inspiration from past maps and twisted those elements to make something very new, Der Eisendrache wore its inspirations proudly on its sleeve. It's not something that would work long term, it would start to feel hollow and pandering if they kept leaning that heavily on nostalgia without ever bringing anything that felt truly new to the table. That's why I actually think it's a good thing that the next map was by far the most controversial one in Black Ops 3. It's good that they weren't just playing it safe and they were still taking those big risks. But, given the context at the time, with the state the zombies community was in, and because of how well it synergized that nostalgia with the more modern design philosophies, it really worked here. All the references to all the best zombies moments that came before, the new, memorable easter egg, the well-designed layout, and the fun, overpowered wonder weapons. Everything was really working together to really earn Der Eisendrache's place as one of the community's most praised maps of all time. We all need 